So I'm going to be um, not serving technology, but rather questioning some of the potential of technology in this context. Um, my talk is talk entitled The Internet of Lettuces, Legibility, Data, and Alternative Food Networks. So there are various utopias and dystopias floating around in this conversation. Uh, and technology plays a key part in both our utopias and, and dystopias. Um, we're going to look at some of these utopias and dystopias with regard to the food system and raise some questions, social, philosophical, moral, and technological. And I can tell you in advance there are no easy answers here. Um, an example of dystopia. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Elaine, is writing a dystopian novel uh, in which all food is the monopoly of one corporation. Growing your own food is illegal. All inhabitants are obliged to buy a certain amount of food, and machine learning is used to work out exactly how much food you're supposed to be buying, so if you don't buy, you must be growing your own tomatoes, which is not allowed. This might seem absurd, but a lot of these dystopians have an unpleasant habit of turning up uh, and becoming reality, and so, I mean, Soylent Green is a famous science fiction thing from the early, early uh, 70s, and now there is a product in the United States called Soylent, which is supposed to solve all your food problems. Um, you will never have to worry about food again, <coughs> is that? Scrap time. <laughs> So another kind of uh, situation is a, a smart utopia. There's lots of talk about smart cities and all that sort of thing, and I was part of a project called Smart Every Food, which is developing a vision for integrating future internet technologies uh, so that you can integrate data from the farm to the <coughs> uh, It's kind of big and ambitious and has a follow-on project called PriceBase, which is developing a platform to do this all. Partly solving some of the problems that were that were being mentioned. So you know you have a, a vision of lots of services uh, offered by various people on this platform, and you can pick and choose and only pay for what you really want. Now it's important to understand what the key motivators for this vision are. It's the need for tracking and tracing of food products. We've had all kinds of food scandals, uh, such as the horse meat scandal and others before that. Um, food crisis, let's call them, rather than scandals. Uh, so E. coli in Germany about two or three years ago uh, caused a huge collapse in the Spanish vegetable market growing because nobody knew exactly where the E. coli was, and they suggested that it might be Spanish cucumbers. Oh, and the um, the cucumbers as well. Yeah. Sorry? It collapsed, total collapse. Yeah. Dutch cucumbers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are huge inefficiencies in the supply chain due, due to the lack of data integration. So because people along the food supply chain don't talk to each other, uh, all kinds of things go wrong. A lot of food gets wasted uh, um, and things like that. There are regulatory pressures. So there are all the time more pressure from uh, the standards organisations, from the government agencies, to know more about what's happening in the food supply chain an important EU directive that's coming into force in December this year, which is uh, forcing even greater uh, knowledge about where the food comes from and, and processes. There's consumer pressure to know about where food is coming from. All of this you all know, it's rather obvious. Um, and it is obviously linked to the need for the research of short chain, local, urban, and all the alternative food networks that we're talking about. So the, the smart utopia says we will solve all this with technologies. Uh, lots of ICT all throughout. On the farm, satellite imagery, uh, drones, <coughs> GPS controlled farm vehicles, data capture of each process, the general precision agriculture paradigm. In the logistics section, we will have GPS controlled lorries, continuous monitoring of the cold chain. There'll be dynamic pricing of food products depending on what the predicted shelf life is and the demand. Uh, you know, reroute the lorry because there's a, there's a bit of rain over there, so they're not going to buy strawberries today and things like that. The retailer, we have point of sale, of sale scanners, club cards, eye tracking, social media analysis, data warehouses, complete analysis of the consumer and what they want. Smart utopia. Right? Now, I want to raise an issue which I think is important to look at from the perspective of alternative networks which is the concept of legibility. 
Some of the social scientists, political scientists here will be familiar with this. It comes from a book by James Scott called Seem Like a State. It's the idea that <coughs> governments in general, and generally big organizations, want to model, map, and catalog everything that is within their domain. And historically, that's for the purpose of taxation, conscription, control, generally. And there's a very tight interplay between technology and this move for greater legibility. So whether it's from Roman roads or the imposition of a metric system by Napoleon or the choice to have passports or ID cards, these are all expressions of the need for legibility. And ICT is the kind of ultimate expression of making things legible. Smartphones, smart meters, automated number plate recognition, automated face recognition, these are all expressions of greater legibility. The surveillance state depends on our ubiquitous use of ICT. They make our individual actions legible to somebody potentially. The map on the right was a map that was developed in Amsterdam a long time ago and provided a very precise location of every Jewish inhabitant so that when the Germans invaded the Netherlands, it was very easy for them to round up every Jewish inhabitant there. It's a classic example of legibility. So, legibility is also tied up with standards. I mentioned the metric system as an example of the standard. And um, you can see standards as a kind of technology that always helps legibility. By having an agreed way of measuring things, an agreed way of communicating, an agreed box size, uh, then things become more visible, more legible, more integrated. Now, I, I wish to stress I'm not, I don't object to greater legibility. I don't object <coughs> because every step along the way, while it reduces or limits certain freedoms, it opens others. So, you know, Roman road system was a way of imposing power over a very large area of Europe. It also allowed trade and communication, something that never happened before. It applies every, at every step of the way. Every bit of technology closes certain doors, opens others. Part of the problem we have is that we don't have any conscious hold over which doors are being opened and which doors are being closed. So when it comes to standards, we have this whole thing to do with food hygiene, and standards tend to play with the big players versus small players. You will all be familiar with, uh, for example, Vandana Shiva's objections to the imposition of standards on small-scale agriculture in India. Uh, there's a wonderful story in Michael Pollan's book published last year, Cooked, about the, uh, the Catholic nun who produces cheese and has a huge fight with uh, the standards people because the way she's producing cheese traditionally, theoretically, should be terrible for, uh, for uh, from the perspective of bacteria and food hygiene, and she has to go off and do a PhD in food chemistry <laughs> to prove to the Connecticut food standards people that actually the way she does it is healthier than doing it in a uh, single bat. It's a brilliant story, but it's a very interesting example of the pressure of standards on a small-scale food producer. So standards are a challenge to alternative food networks. Not intentionally. It's not that wicked people with standards they're wanting to destroy all terms of food network. It's just the nature of the beast. And crucially, when we come back to ICT, it's an issue of who owns the data. Remember, legibility, more data makes things more legible. Standards makes the collection of data more easy. Who controls that data? After all, the need for data is what's driving the regulatory, the consumer, and the business interest. Right? If data is held by one company, for example, Google and Amazon, or a small number of companies, look at the seed retailers in the world, on Santos and Gentle DuPont, they control the market. Amazon is fundamentally a data company. 
They collect data and they use data in order to do things. And this is where it becomes really important to look at alternative food networks from a data perspective. Because who has that data on where the lettuces are and who wants the lettuces? So, here is the effect on alternative food networks. Notice how people love Amazon Marketplace. Amazon, strange company, lets other people sell products on their website. How weird. It's not so weird. They collect the data. That's what they're really interested in. Right? So data equals access to consumers. Now, alternative food networks in principle and in theory and in practice and ideologically, and you can see that all over the are trying to circumvent the system. But the reality is they will still be part of the system, especially when they scale up. So the question is, who owns data when they scale up? There are cautionary tales. Some of you may know Uber, the up-and-coming taxi service that's taking over the world. It's an alternative taxi network controlled by California. Competition will be eliminated due to the network effect. So look at the impact of Amazon on the markets for books, music, everything, soon food. When is Amazon delivering food? Amazon Fresh. Exactly. So with Uber, you've got one centralized organization based in California, which potentially is going to know about every taxi ride in every city in the world. And it's an alternative taxi network. Might be wonderful, but might not. So the problem is the network effect. The network effect typically occurs in social networks. <coughs> so somebody starts a social network and gets your friends on it, so everybody needs to join because it's the network that you belong to. So the classic example is the telephone. As soon as people started using telephones, everybody had to have a telephone to talk to everybody else on the phone. The more recent examples are things like Facebook, which completely dominates the social network world. I mean, if you are not on Facebook, you're really not on part of the social network, except if you are sort of looking at it only from perspective of business, and you might be on LinkedIn. Uh, there are certain regional differences, but this, this is the fundamental truth. So the more people use a technology of system X, Y, Z, the more everybody needs to use it. The implication for food system is that leads to concentration in a few hands, which at the supermarket level we already see. So what's going to happen <coughs> with alternative food networks and the use of digital technologies in alternative food networks? How do alternative food networks avoid the network effect, or at least avoid the negative bits of the network effect? Can we construct digital technologies that function not as a concentration of power, <coughs> but still allow a flow of communication and information. So the problem of friction, or lack of it. A frictionless market is where all costs and restraints associated with the transaction are non-existent. So this is what Amazon tries to do with one click. You look at a book, click, I bought it. You look at an object, click, you bought it. That's frictionless purchasing. And that's really an idea in many, many from a marketing perspectives in lots of ways. Supermarkets you can see as fundamental forerunners of frictionless, mark, of, of frictionless shopping. You go to one place, you go around, collect your things, you pay for one person. Uh, we had this app presented just a moment ago about purchasing across the market with, with trying to reduce, it was an attempt to reduce friction in effect. The trouble is, food needs friction. The introduction of friction increases meaning, knowledge, appreciation, and trust. And that's rather important as it comes to food. So there's, using ICT, there's a contradiction between the requirements of a sustainable food system, which basically needs things to be relatively slow or relatively meaningful. And ICT which is trying to make everything very quick and immediate and kind of instant. 
the more instant you make things, the less individual instances will have any particular significant meaning. Information theory will tell you that. So the question is, can ICT support alternative food networks by reducing the right sort of friction? I don't know. I, I leave that as an open question. <laughs> so trust. Trust. You know, why do we like farmers' markets? This is the farmers' market in, in Crete. You, know, you go there, you see all these fruit and vegetables, you talk to the person, the whole relationship. You don't actually want to get through the market too quickly. Yes, you don't want to spend three hours there, but actually spending an hour in the market is fun. And you know the guy. You bought the lettuces last week, or the vegetables, or whatever, and they were delicious. So you're going to go back. You're going to check. Are they the same? As opposed to the checkout front in the supermarket, where there is much less trust, there's much less data, there's much less friction. So, one of the things we need to look at is the way data is really infrastructure. So, one of the ways we could reduce the dangers of the network effect is to treat data as a commons, like open roads, like freely available water. Common data and open data provides an infrastructure. I'd like to know where the lettuces are, who's growing them, for free, and allow people to build businesses on top of that. I mean, we can argue the line, what should be open and what should not be, where is the business added value, but at least there should be a principle that there should be a part of the whole thing should be open and freely available data upon which things can occur. So the argument must be articulated for open data infrastructure. Otherwise, smart utopia becomes reality. There's a strong movement for open data in agri-food around the world. Examples include Godan, which is the big initiative of the World Bank and FAO and other actors to make more uh, data about food available. However, unfortunately, it's still dominated by research data. It needs to be extended to production, to product and production data, real time. The business case is excellent. There's a huge body of evidence about how powerful it is to make data available, even a little bit of data. So if we want alternative food networks, then data must be a commons. Open data needs regulatory and policy support. And ICT technologies need to choose how they make certain actions easier and not take a blanket view that any kind of things that make it faster, slow, faster is necessarily better. <coughs> the Internet of Lettuces, a utopia. In the Internet of Lettuces, the lettuces will speak. I can find out where the lettuces are, who has them, or are they? <coughs> I can ask the lettuce where it came from, how it was grown. Is it a humane lettuce? Possibly, just possibly. I may eat my local lettuce. Thank you.